Here's a metal wire. Because it's metal, the charge carriers are free electrons, negatively charged particles. Now let's imagine that there's a uniform density of free electrons from the center of the wire toward the edge of the wire. In other words, if there's an axis that runs down the center as we work our way out, R gets greater and greater and greater. The number of free electrons per cross-sectional area has a, a consistent uh, density. So maybe there's a high potential on the left side and a low potential on the right end. And there's going to be an electric field that points from high potential towards low potential. That's always the nature of electric fields. They always point from high potential to low potential. And electric fields exert forces on charged particles. Now, the charged particles, in this case being free electrons, experience a force opposite the direction of the electric field. The true path of these electrons might be some kind of a zigzag as they undergo multiple collisions. But in time, the net effect is they're all going to drift to the left. So we can just simplify it and show a bunch of arrows on every single electron pointing to the left and say that's due to some drift velocity to the left. In the previous lesson, we defined electric current as the rate at which the charge flows through the wire. So we say amps are the same thing as coulombs per second. What I might have failed to say is that uh, we define current as the flow of positive charge. Or at least that's what we mean when we speak of something called conventional current. And that's really what we mean every time we see this symbol I, the conventional current. Conventional current is the flow rate of positive charge. Now you might say, wait a minute, what gives here? Positive charges aren't flowing at all. All these things that are drifting are electrons, and electrons are negatively charged. So we have negative charged particles drifting to the left in this example. Well, I want you to consider an electron that drifts to the left like this. Well, because it leaves this area and now shows up here, for a moment, this region of the wire appears to be positively charged because it's lacking that electron. But of course, another electron over here in the conductor is going to drift to the left and fill in that place, canceling out that positive charge. But now the electron is no longer here, so now this region seems to be positive. Well, you see where I'm going with this. Another electron is going to drift into that space, neutralizing this segment of the wire, leaving for a moment in time this portion of the wire positive. So yeah, as the electrons drift to the left, it gives the appearance that positive charge is moving to the right. We can't distinguish between these two. There's no difference in the effect of having negative charges move to the left or positive charges move to the right. So even though electrons might have a drift to the left, we say the current flows to the right because what we mean by current is the conventional current, the flow of positive charge. I'm going to put a radial axis on this wire. So working our way outward, we have capital R. There's a uh, ring I've drawn, R1, another one, R2. And so I'm just picturing greater and greater cross-sectional area. So this current represents the flow of charge throughout the entire volume of this wire. But you might ask the question, what fraction of that current is flowing through this innermost cross-sectional area. And if we increase it, how much more current is flowing here? So now I want to talk about not so much current, but something we refer to as current density. We'll symbolize that with capital J. We say the current density is the current per unit area or rearrange that, current is the density of current times the area. 
Yeah, so if these electrons are uniformly distributed across the cross-sectional area that our eye sees when we look down the axis of this wire, if current can be found by multiplying current density times area. In other words, if the amps per square meter multiplied by square meter cancel to give us amps, then we can compare this equation to the equation of a line y equals mx plus b. So I expect to get a y-intercept of zero and a slope of constant value if I place area on the x-axis. In other words, I want to make a graph of current versus increasing cross-sectional area. Small cross-sectional area, a fraction of this total current I, flows through that innermost cross-section. We make the cross-sectional area even bigger, and even more of the current shows up, and as we increase the cross-sectional area, more and more of this total current is accounted for. So we just get a straight line for our graph of current versus area because I is equal to J times A. And so we just have a straight line with a slope equal to the current density. What's that mean for a graph of current versus R? as R goes from R1 to R2 to capital R, well, cross-sectional area is pi R squared, so I is equal to J pi R squared. So now we have a graph that looks like a parabola. The current is proportional to R to the second power. Of course, this isn't how it has to look when our eye looks down the axis of the wire we might see that the amount of current through this centralmost cross-section might be very small. And then as we increase the radius and therefore we increase the cross-sectional area, the current might dramatically increase. In other words, J, the current density, doesn't have to be constant or uniform. In fact, the current density could be some function of R. We have R1, R2, capital R. Maybe, hypothetically, we could say that J is equal to some constant. Maybe we'll use the Greek letter alpha times R. In other words, when the eyeball looks down the axis of the wire, we see the charge carriers, these electrons, are not uniformly dispersed. They seem to be more dense towards the perimeter or the outer edge of the wire. That actually happens often in the conduction DC and direct current conduction of electricity. There's something known as the skin effect, which says that a larger uh, portion of the current is flowing on the surface than through the inner portion. So this isn't too bad of a hypothetical case. So earlier when I said current density is the current per unit area, that's certainly always true of current density, at least in terms of the units. We always express current density in amps per square meter. However, I think this would just be a way of calculating the average current density. But then again, when current density is uniform, there's no distinction between the average current density or the current density of any chosen portion of the cross-section. But when the current density is non-uniform, then we say, okay, how does the current density here in region A compare to the current density here in region B? Well, if I just take any sample 
of cross-sectional area, maybe some DA here, and I take another sample of cross-sectional area, DA right here, then the current density is whatever fraction of the current is flowing in that fraction of the cross-section. So that's probably a better description for current density. If that's the case, by rearranging, di is equal to j times dA. So if I want to know, for example, what fraction of the total current, right? We've got a total current, capital I, flowing to the right in this wire. If this end is high potential and this end is low potential, what fraction of that current flows through um, this fractional cross-section? Well, it would just be equal to J times that dA. And if I want to get the total amount of current, then I have to add up this additional amount. So to say I'm going to add up all the contributions to the overall current, and I can say the total current is just the summation of all the contributions to the current, which in turn is the integral of JDA. So in our given example, where we said the current density conceivably could be something like uh, alpha r, then the total current is equal to the integral of alpha r times dA. Now what's dA? Well, since I'm picturing increasing cross-sectional area in the form of these circles, since area is pi r squared, dA then would be 2 pi r dr. So the next step of our solution to finding the total current we substitute for dA 2 pi r dr. Let's take all the constants out of the integral. So 2 pi alpha times the integral of r squared dr as we go from 0, from the center, to the edge, r equals capital R. Then we get a total current equal to 2 thirds pi alpha capital R cubed. And if I just want to know how much current flows through the wire up to this radius, r less than capital R, then I guess we can express this as a function. The current up to any uh, distance would be equal to 2 thirds pi alpha lowercase r cubed. So our graph of current versus radius is still concave up but it's not i proportional to r squared as it was in our previous example here where the current density was uniform. In this example, based on this hypothetical, this would actually be i is proportional to r cubed. And the current versus the area is no longer linear. That graph is also concave up. The bottom line to all this is we can speak of the current in a wire, which is strictly the number of amps, which is the same thing as coulombs per second, or we can speak of current density, which is amps per square meter. That current density in some cases could be uniform or constant, or in other cases could be a function of radius. And no matter what, the total current can always be found by taking the integral of JDA.